The purpose of this video is to debate the statements made by Jimmy Ekin in his recent interview on the Catholic Answers program titled, Focus, Concerning Whether God Can Change His Mind and Has the Capacity for Emotion. Robertson Jenis has written the script for this debate. He will answer all the challenges brought up by Jimmy Ekin, who takes the position that God cannot change his mind and does not have emotion, while Robertson Jenis takes the opposite view. Our analysis will work as follows. We will let Jimmy Ekin state his position on a particular topic and if we have something to say, we will pause the video and begin debating the point at that time. Once we are finished with a particular section, we will resume with Jimmy Ekin until we need to interrupt again. The debate will proceed like this until the end. Can God change his mind? Jimmy Aiken. Now, hello and welcome to Focus, the Catholic Answers podcast for living, understanding, and defending your Catholic faith. I'm Cy Kellett, your host, and this time we take a question that came from a listener. We're delighted that people have been sending us questions. By the way, you can send us something that you'd like us to talk about here on Focus. Just send it to focus at catholic.com. And this question, can God change his mind? It would appear uh, from scripture that God can change his mind. It would appear from philosophy and from advanced theology that God cannot change his mind. Notice that Mr. Kellett has pinpointed the difference in views and where they originate. He says, quote, it would appear, from scripture, that God can change his mind. It would appear from philosophy and from advanced theology that God cannot change his mind, unquote. Mr. Kellett is astoundingly accurate in this statement. Scripture says one thing, but philosophy and advanced theology say the very opposite. So right from the get-go the battle lines are drawn between what Scripture says and what certain men say about Scripture. This will be the theme that runs through our critique of Mr. Ekin and his answers to this important question. How do we reconcile these things? Well, the perfect guy to ask about that is the guy who wrote this book, The Words of Eternal Life, True Happiness and Where to Find It. That's the new book from Jimmy Aiken. So we asked Jimmy, come on in and explain to us, can God change his mind? Thank you, Jimmy, again, for joining us on Focus. Appreciate that. My pleasure, Cy Uh So this question uh, comes from uh, a listener who suggested it uh, via our email, and it's about whether or not God changes his mind. And I looked up a couple of passages of Scripture to share with you, because in, uh -huh. in Exodus... Uh, 32 uh, in Exodus chapter 32 verse 14 uh, Moses has to try to convince God not to do some smiting because uh, people have mm -hmm. uh, not been uh, holding up their doing, end yeah doing what, not been doing what they should right yeah. exactly uh, and so uh, Moses is very, a very good lawyer apparently because Exodus 32 14 so the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he would do to his people now I'm going to continue in uh, the first uh, in First Samuel chapter 15 verse 29. We get this about God. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change His mind, for He is not a man that He should change His mind. I mm -hmm. perceive a slight conflict there. Uh -huh. God changes his mind, and I and who to turn to except Jimmy Aiken to resolve these uh, kinds of things. So in Exodus, we have God changing his mind, and actually, I think uh, throughout Scripture, you could probably find. I mean, I'm sure you could just off the top of your head give me more episodes where God changes his mind, or where we're told that God mm -hmm. can't change his mind. So, the question that came to us from the listener, I've he's read Scripture. He wants to know: Can God change his mind? Okay, so the. I, uh, there are a couple of ways to approach this question. The basic answer, though, is no. Okay. So this will be a really short episode, I guess. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. No, God can't change his mind. Okay, but I okay, have a little bit of explanation. Uh, okay. Then why would we see Scripture? I, I think this is the, the crux of it. Why would yeah. we see Scripture seeming to suggest that God changes his mind? The reason is be, it's, in, it's mentioned in the latter passage that you quoted from Samuel that God is not a man. Obviously, God is not a man, except, of course, in the God-man, Jesus Christ, but we are only dealing with the divine nature in this matter, not the human nature of Christ. The question at issue is, what does Samuel mean when he says that God is not a man? The answer can only be extracted from the context which is something Mr. Ekin has not done here. A simple question will clarify what we mean. 
If we conclude that Samuel says God cannot change his mind simply because Samuel specifies that God is not a man, then what happens when we read passages in the Bible that say God changed his mind, such as Amos 7 6 where God says, quote, The Lord repented concerning this, this also shall not be, said the Lord God, unquote. Should we then conclude, using Mr. Ekin's logic, that God is, indeed, like man because he changed his mind? Obviously, this is not the proper way to interpret Samuel's words. There are other factors we need to consider before we make conclusions. The first thing we need to look at is the context of the passage Mr. Kellett chose, 1 Samuel 15 29. Again, the verse itself states, quote, And also the glory of Israel will not lie or repent, for he is not a man, that he should repent, unquote. As we will see, this statement is in a context that contrasts the dishonesty of Saul over against the integrity of God. As the story goes, Saul was told in verse 3 to slaughter all the Amalekites, including their women, children, and animals. Saul did so, except he kept Egag the king and the sheep and oxen alive. In God's view, Saul did not do what God required. Saul's punishment was for him to surrender the kingdom. God kept his word and punished Saul, as noted in 1 Samuel 15, verses 10 and 11. Quote, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I repent that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me, and has not performed my commandments. Unquote. Notice that the Lord says, quote, I repent that I have made Saul king. Unquote. But the word repent here is the same Hebrew word, nakam, that is used in the original verse in question, 1 Samuel 15 29, which says, quote, and also the glory of Israel will not lie or repent, for he is not a man, that he should repent." Unquote. So we see that the answer to the question is not in the direction that Mr. Eking tried to cast it, that is, claiming God can't change his mind simply because he is not a man. As it stands, one verse in the context says God repents, while the other says God does not repent. Why the difference? We can't know until we delve deeper into the story to find out what this Hebrew word, nakam, or repent, really means and exactly how it is being used in both verses. The deeper context tells us that the use of the word repent in verse 11 refers to God's desire not to have Saul as king any longer. That is, God changed his mind about having Saul as king. But we see that the same word, repent, that is used in verse 29 is coupled with the phrase not lie. Not lie is from the Hebrew shakar, and is translated as, quote, the glory of Israel will not lie or repent, for he is not a man, that he should repent, unquote. Hence the word repent, the Hebrew nakam, has a moral quality to it in verse 29 because it is coupled with the phrase not lie, whereas the same word, nakam, in verse 10 is a change of mind. We can surmise, then, that the use of the word repent in verse 29 refers to God's integrity to keep his word. In other words, God is not like men who often frivolously or erratically change their minds, as Saul did, for example. God is always honest. He always does the right thing. In the end, verse 29 of 1 Samuel 15, is not teaching that God cannot change his mind, for verse 10 already told us that God can, indeed, change his mind. Verse 29 is merely teaching that God is honest and never lies about what he says. He always means what he says and says what he means. As we will see, this is one of the most important axiomatic truths we will need in order to interpret scripture correctly, especially when we get to other passages that talk about God changing his mind. Another passage that teaches a similar message is Malachi 3 6. It says, quote, For I the Lord do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed, unquote. Some are tempted to use this single passage to make various claims about God's immutability, such as our beloved Thomas Aquinas. Although God is certainly immutable, 
otherwise he couldn't be God, this passage is not headed in that direction. Rather, the context of the passage reveals in verses 3 and 4 that God is complaining about the sins of Israel, and that Israel has departed from the former days of giving honest sacrifices to God. In other words, the Jews have changed their attitude toward God. They no longer fear Him, as verse 5 stipulates, quote, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the orphan, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts, unquote. In contrast to the Israelites, God reminds them he has not changed his relationship with them, and it is precisely because he hasn't changed that Israel is not yet destroyed but is given time to repent. Thus God says in verse 7, quote, Return to me, and I will return to you, unquote. Of course, as God says in Malachi 3 6 that he hasn't changed, it implies that he could change his disposition, that is, he could change from mercy to wrath, and if so, Israel would be judged. In this way, Malachi 3 6 is very similar to 1 Samuel 15 10 when God changed his mind about having Saul as king. God went from mercy to judgment concerning Saul, and he could move from mercy to judgment against Israel. Another similar passage is the one we mentioned earlier, Amos 7, 1-6. In this context, God has sent swarms of locusts against Israel's crops but Amos complains that the judgment is too severe, so God changes his mind and stops the judgment. Not only does God stop the judgment, Amos shows God saying, quote, this will not happen, unquote. In another judgment, God is sending fire on the land, but Amos complains to God, and God stops the judgment and says, quote, this will not happen either, unquote. As we can see, these passages show that God, indeed, changes his mind, and the change is almost always conditioned on the free will choices of men who compel God to take alternative action, than what he had already performed. In fact, we can safely say that God changes his mind because his justice demands he do so, otherwise God would be unjust if he did not change his will and act appropriately upon men's sins. Essentially, the ability to change his mind is part of God's nature, his immutable nature. Since he is immutable, then God will always judge sin when he sees it or show mercy when someone repents, and this will require him to change his mind from mercy to judgment or from judgment to mercy, respectively. And really, when you, when you look at what God's nature is in light of all of the revelation he's given us, we realize that God is an infinite, uncreated spirit, and that has some implications. Among the implications are, he's not subject to space and time, the way we are. Unfortunately, instead of looking into the context of 1 Samuel 15, as well as consulting other similar passages, Mr. Eking chooses to impose deep metaphysical concepts on the passage. Instead of discussing the historical narratives and what they mean, we are burdened with arguing about metaphysics. But, for the sake of argument, let's look at Mr. Eakin's metaphysical arguments to see if they have any merit in themselves. First, he says that God is infinite and is an uncreated spirit, and these two attributes mean, according to Mr. Eakin, that God is, quote, not subject to space and time, unquote, as we are. He explains more in his next statement because he created space and time. So he himself, in his essence, is outside of space and time. And if you're outside of time, that means you don't change. So, Mr. Eakin holds as a premise that if one is outside of time, that means one cannot change. But what kind of change is Mr. Eakin referring to? Normally we understand this metaphysical premise to mean God does not change in his essence or substance. In that way we understand his essence as immutable. Obviously, if God did change in his essence or substance he would not only be mutable, he would not be God, for by definition God is immutable. But as we discovered, 1 Samuel 15 29, 
the passage which says, quote, And also the glory of Israel will not lie or repent, for he is not a man, that he should repent, unquote, is not speaking about God's metaphysical immutability, per se. It is merely saying that God does not lie or make rash decisions like men do. Granted, one might argue that God does not lie because God is immutable in his divine character, but that goes without saying. The focus or end result of 1 Samuel 15:29 is to reveal that God has perfect integrity when he deals with man, not that God possesses the raw attributes of infinity and uncreatedness. In fact, one may ask, what the result of God's infinity and uncreatedness is. One of the answers will be, God is perfectly honest in his dealings with men. But in being honest, God sometimes changes his mind about how he deals with us. If we act righteously, God will show mercy. If we act unrighteously, God will change to wrath. More importantly, God's immutable nature includes both mercy for repentance and righteousness but wrath for sin and unrighteousness. So when he sees repentance and righteousness, he is merciful. When he sees sin and unrighteousness, he will be wrathful. If God, in his immutable nature, were only merciful and loving, then he could never show wrath when confronted with sin. He would be an inept God. As such, God's immutable nature must allow him to change from wrath to mercy or mercy to wrath. Both are part of his immutable nature, and he decided when to use one or the other. And if you don't change, that means you don't change your mind. Mr. Ekin is trying to make the argument that since God does not change in his essence then he cannot change his mind. But does immutability in essence inhibit one from changing his mind? How would Mr. Ekin prove such to be the case? It is certainly not axiomatic, but Mr. Ekin is pretending that it is. As we noted earlier, one could just as easily argue against Mr. Ekin that because God is immutable in essence then he is sometimes compelled to change his mind, that is, when a change of mind is the right and just thing for an immutable being to do. This is because God's righteousness, and justice are just as immutable as his substance. They are all one, and they don't compete with one another. Consequently, if God's essence already incorporates the fact, that he can change his mind when he needs to, then obviously no change in essence is needed for a change of mind. This would especially be true if, for example, in the course of temporal events God had decided on one course of action but then changed his mind because a better course, a more just and righteous course, presented itself, as when he judged Saul for not obeying him. Yes, Mr. E. King could argue that God already knew he would change to the second course of action. But that does not demonstrate that God cannot change his mind. It only proves that God knows all his future actions. Still, one may argue that because God knows all his future actions then, in the final analysis, he is not changing from what we might call his ultimate course of action. He is only changing his temporal course of action. But this means that the temporal course of action, such as God stating in Exodus 32 9 that he has every intention of destroying Israel, must be just as true and genuine as anything we construe as God's ultimate course of action since it all comes from God who cannot lie. That is, God is not putting on an act, like men often do, in Exodus 32 9 in order to get Moses to plead with him, as if the ends justifies the means. For God, since he cannot lie and must always be honest, the means must always justify the ends, that is, the means of getting Moses to plead with him must be just as genuine, and honest as Moses pleading with him, and both require that God be truly honest about his wanting to destroy Israel. On another level, someone might argue that God, in his infinite knowledge, knows what decisions men will make, and therefore God isn't really changing his mind because he already knew he would be merciful before Amos made his request. But God's foreknowledge of what he will do or decide does not negate the simple fact that God changed his mind. The fact remains that God started the fire and then God stopped the fire and no amount of foreknowledge is going to lessen that fact. Hence, 
we must avoid the trap of claiming that because God knows what he or men will decide means that the biblical narratives we have covered, narratives that show God changing his mind, cannot be genuine accounts of what occurred or of how God actually thinks or acts in sequence. In another passage, for example, Exodus 32 9, God declares to Moses he is going to destroy all of Israel for worshipping the golden calf. God actually says the following, quote, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people, now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them, but of you I will make a great nation, unquote. Then, in verses 11 to 13, Moses talks back to God and pleads with him, presenting two logical reasons why he shouldn't destroy Israel. Then, in verse 14, we see that the reasons are sufficient enough to appease God, after which it is said, quote, Then the Lord changed his mind and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened, unquote. Now, since we have already discovered from our analysis of 1 Samuel 15 that God means what he says and says what he means and does not tell falsehoods like men do, then we must accept as a veritable fact that when God verbalized his intention to destroy Israel in Exodus 32:10, that God's integrity, as an honest communicator, means that he really intended to destroy Israel. If we don't accept God's verbalization of his intent as a true intent, then it inevitably means God was lying to Moses, which we know is metaphysically impossible because God cannot lie. Hence if someone wants to use metaphysics to analyze this passage, the first metaphysics he should apply is to verse 10 and thereby conclude that God actually intended, with every fiber of his divine being, that he was going to destroy Israel, otherwise God is not being honest with Moses or us. We must also accept that Moses pleading with God is an actual pleading, not story filler or play acting, a pleading that had a direct effect on God's reasonings, otherwise the text is again lying to us about what actually occurred. Consequently, we must also accept that God's change of mind is a true change of mind that stems from his very essence, that is, a change from wanting to destroy Israel to not wanting to destroy Israel, otherwise both God and the text are lying to us. Someone might object that if God knew what was going to happen, isn't it like play acting if God says he is going to destroy Israel but knows that, in the end, he is not. How serious can his decision to destroy Israel be if, in the end of the story, he knows he is not going to destroy Israel? Perhaps one of the better answers that has been given is St. Augustine's, which is, that God cannot change the future any more than we can change the past. Since there can be only one actual future out of all possible or potential futures, then the future that actually occurs is the only one that can occur. In that sense it does not make any difference whether God knows the future or not, because even he cannot change the actual future that will eventually exist. It is impossible, even for God. In that sense, God's foreknowledge of the future is superfluous. But Augustine's solution does not really answer the main question at issue, that is, how can God make an honest statement in verses 9 and 10 that he is going to destroy Israel if he knows beforehand the future stated in verse 14 which says he is not going to destroy Israel. Obviously, Moses took God's words in verses 9 and 10 about God's intention to destroy Israel very seriously and as a veritable fact. It is the very reason he was compelled to appease God so that God would not destroy Israel. Moses certainly did not say to himself, quote, God doesn't really mean what he is saying. He is just angry and he will get over it soon enough, unquote. That thought would have made God a liar. Even worse, if God did not really intend to destroy Israel but said words to Moses that acted as if he wanted to destroy Israel, then God is merely an actor who gives false impressions knowing that he never intends on following through with them. No, Moses knew God had every intention of destroying Israel, because God never lies. He had seen God in action for forty years as God prepared him to lead Israel out of Egypt. If there is anyone who knew God it was Moses. Later in Exodus 33, for example, it says that Moses spoke directly to God as a man speaks to a friend. These two beings, divine and human, 
were as close as close could be. They knew each other intimately, and neither of them would ever play act in front of the other. Quite frankly, the seeming dichotomy between what God does presently and what God knows of the future is not our problem. It is God's problem, and for Him, of course, it is not really a problem at all. It is no more our problem than trying to explain how there can be three separate beings, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, yet have only one God. Or trying to explain how Jesus can be 100% man and 100% God, yet still be only one person. Or trying to explain how Christ can be the substance of the Eucharist but the bread is no longer there and yet still taste, smell, and act like real bread. Or trying to explain how God can know all events that will ever transpire and yet still give man an uncoerced free will to decide his own fate, otherwise known as the problem of predestination and free will. We just assume that both are true because God says both are true, and any more discussion is superfluous. Obviously God has an answer to all of these apparent antinomies and thus there is no contradiction since we take as an absolute premise that God cannot lie. So it goes for Exodus 32. If, in Exodus 32 14, God cannot lie in saying he is not going to destroy Israel, then it follows metaphysically that, in Exodus 32 10, he cannot lie when he shows every intention of destroying Israel. Both must be metaphysically true, not just the one in which God does not destroy Israel. In the end, we don't have to cover for God. We just have to believe what he says. We don't have to make up scenarios to make God look good, as it were. When we do, we often make the medicine worse than the disease and turn God into something he is not. Essentially, it is not our problem to figure out and we couldn't even if we tried. The fact remains that God changed his mind about destroying Israel, and anyone who tries to explain this passage by claiming that God did not change his mind is essentially calling God a liar. What we do know from what God has taught us about himself in scripture is that he cannot lie and thus his integrity will not allow him to play act, that is, he cannot appear or portray himself as one thing and yet be something or do something totally different. In other words, when God tells Moses in Exodus 32 9 that he is fed up with Israel and in his anger wants to destroy them, these are facts about God coming directly from his divine essence just as much as any other attribute of God. God cannot lie to Moses about his intentions to destroy Israel or about his anger that brought him to that point. If he did, then he would be just like man, telling falsehoods to cover himself. This also means that unless Moses appeased God there would be no apparent reason for God to spare the Israelites. This goes hand in hand with the fact that God and Moses had a very personal relationship. In other words, it is because God loved Moses so much that he listened to Moses' plea for Israel. If any other person had tried to appease God, for example, Aaron, the one who led Israel into sin, God would have probably destroyed him and Israel on the spot. Is God determined or free? The other important matter to discuss here is that to base everything on God's ultimate course of action and then work backwards, so that all that happened prior is nothing more than a series of cause and effects that eventually lead to the ultimate future is that it tends to make God a determined being. But the Church teaches that God is not determined, but is free. If God is a determined being, this means there is some law behind God that forces God to do what he does to reach an ultimate end. The Church teaches, however, that God is not bound to one course of action but is free to choose any course of action that is commensurate with his goodness, especially if there is more than one action that is good. For example, the Church teaches that God was free to create the world or not create the world, and that either decision would be commensurate with his goodness. The Church teaches on the one hand, that God knows and has planned all things, but, on the other hand, that God had the freedom not to create, and thus the creation was not determined. For example, Vatican Council 1 states. Quote, this sole true God by his goodness and omnipotent power, not to increase his own beatitude, 
and not to add to, but to manifest his perfection by the blessings which he bestows on creatures, with most free volition, immediately from the beginning of them fashioned each creature out of nothing." Unquote. The phrase, with most free volition, means that God freely chose to create, and that it was not determined, by him or anything else. Likewise, at the Council of Constance, the Church condemned the teaching of John Wycliffe, one of the first Protestants, who said, quote, all things happen from absolute necessity, unquote. See Denzinger, paragraph 607. In a similar way, the Church says, quote, and we are not unaware that in the same books those teachings are stated and defended which are plainly opposed to the Catholic doctrine about the supreme liberty of God, who is free from any necessity whatsoever in creating things." Unquote. This was stated against the false doctrine of Anton Gunter, and is found in Denzinger paragraph 1655. Finally, the Church condemned the teaching of Antonius de Rosmini Serbati who said, quote, the love, by which God loves himself even in creatures, and which is the reason why he determines himself to create, constitutes a moral necessity, which in the most perfect being always induces the effect, for such necessity in many imperfect beings only leaves the whole freedom bilateral." Unquote. See Denzinger paragraph 1908. Although the Church has not explained how God's determinations and freedom work together, she has at least told us the boundaries of the discussion. We are to accept both as true. The Church has no other recourse than to come to an open-ended conclusion, since to answer in the alternative would mean that God is a determined being, and thus some determined law behind God is in control of God and dictates to him what must be performed. But there is no law behind God, otherwise the law would be God. God is God and he answers to no one but himself. As the Catholic philosopher, Michael Dodds, has put it. Quote, Nor can he be the mover with respect to one part of himself and move with respect to another, for then he would not be the first mover or secundum say, but only by reason of some part of himself. That part would then be in some sense prior to him, and he would not be the first mover. Therefore God must be altogether immovable or omnino immobile, unquote. From his book, The Unchanging God of Love, page 91. Still, if our solution to the enigma rests in the nature of God, yet it is agreed that God determines things but is free, then the discussion has not really advanced. Not surprisingly, in all of Christian history, no one has been able to explain this apparent contradiction in the divine essence, at least from the human perspective since ultimately there is no contradiction in God. Nevertheless, since the enigma exists from the human perspective, this means that all of man's metaphysical propositions, but especially his interpretations of scripture, must be cognizant of the apparent antinomy between God's determinations and God's freedoms, but, above all, it must be faithful to both. When we apply this metaphysical antinomy to the issue of whether God can change his mind when he deals with changing temporal situations, such as human beings who at one time sin and later repent, we begin to see the possibilities open up concerning God having both infinite knowledge of everything he will do, yet the freedom to change his mind, most notably when he deals with contingencies in the human realm. Surely, if God can determine to create the world yet had the freedom not to create it, then it is only logical to extend that duality to the fact that God can know all events that will take place, and still be able to change his mind. It is a logical tautology that cannot be denied no matter how hard it is for us to understand. It seems Aquinas agrees with this logic. As Michael Dodds notes, quote, It is still possible however, that this first mover move itself. Further analysis shows, however, that such a self-mover may not move itself as a whole, for then it would be in act and potency at the same time in the same respect so one part of it must be immovable, and moving the other. Yet it is still possible that this immovable part is immovable only per se and movable per accidents. When that possibility is disproved, the conclusion is reached that there is a mover that is moved neither per se nor per accidents. Yet this mover, 
though not moved in the physical order, may yet be moved in the order of will by the object of its love and desire. The object desired by this mover is therefore higher in the order of motion, and is an entirely unmoved mover. So an absolutely immovable being is discovered that is identified as God. Aquinas is careful to point out that this being, though changeless, is not lifeless, unquote. Taken from Dodd's book, The Unchanging Love of God, page 90. This understanding of God's movement is confirmed by Augustine's use of the same principle. As Dodds puts it. Quote, since Augustine says, quote, the Creator Spirit moves himself, unquote, and since anything that moves itself must be movable, his words seem to imply that God is movable. Thomas explains that Augustine is using the word motion in the broad sense to refer to the acts of understanding, willing, and loving. Such acts, as we have seen, do not imply imperfection since they are not the act of something existing in potency, but the act of something existing in act. Motion of this sort may be affirmed of God, since he is said to know himself and love himself. Only motion that implies potency and imperfection must be denied, unquote. Taken from Dodd's book, pages 101 and 102. So, if God is not moved by anything outside himself but is moved in his own will by his own love and desire for the contemplated object, then logically God has the freedom to act on this love and desire, or not act upon it. This also implies that the love and desire will exist in God even if God does not act upon it, which implies that God must decide whether it is worth it for him to satisfy his love and desire by an act of creation, since the creation would most likely include a creature who, made in God's image, would have the same free will that God has, and would thus have the ability to accept or reject God, as angels and men certainly do. In light of the foregoing, we should also take note of Dodd's explanation for why God creates. In one statement he bases the creative act on God's goodness. He writes, quote, Seeing God's creative act in relation to divine immutability allows us to recognize God's freedom in creating. We can explore the freedom of any act in terms of how it is ordered to its end. The end for which God acts in the work of creation is his own goodness, the proper object of his will. God wills this with absolute necessity and all other things as they are ordered to it, unquote. Of course, this raises the question of why God would need creatures to extend his goodness when God already possesses perfect goodness. In the Thomistic metaphysics, creatures cannot add to God's goodness. Dodds cites Aquinas to this effect, saying, quote, because his goodness is eternal and immutable, nothing is able to be added to it, unquote. As such, God cannot will the creature's existence by absolute necessity. Dodds recognizes this when he then says, quote, we recognize God's creative act as proceeding not from necessity, but from unbounded freedom, unquote. This then leads to the question of what, precisely, motivated God to use his freedom to create. Dodds believes the answer lies in Aquinas' statement that, quote, God produced creatures not because he needed them, nor because of any other extrinsic reason, but on account of the love of his own goodness, unquote. So instead of adding goodness, God loves his already immutable goodness. The question then arises as to why, in the Thomistic metaphysics, God would want or need to love his own goodness by creating creatures, since his goodness was already immutably, and infinitely loved by himself. Unfortunately, Dodds does not entertain this question. Perhaps a better answer would be that since the Father begets the Son in love, and from the love of the Father and Son the Holy Spirit proceeds, then love as the motivation for the material creation is based on the love of the Father who was neither begotten nor proceeded. Philosophically, love becomes the bridge between the universal and particular or the one and the many. Of course, we are then left with trying to understand what begetting and proceeding mean with respect to the Trinity which is eternal and has no beginning. With St. John Chrysostom we say, quote, I have no idea what begetting means, unquote. Nevertheless, it seems that the begetting of the Son, 
and the proceeding of the Holy Spirit is the key to the creation. As we extend the principle of God's freedom, we have the foundational paradigm for our thesis. That is, if we regard and apply God's freedom in the same way we do His determinations, this means that the interplay between determination and freedom does not stop with God's prerogative to create, or not create. The interplay between determination and freedom must include every subsequent action of God, and do so in pure act and not in potentiality. This is so because, as the Church teaches, God is immutable and does not change. What He was in eternity past He will be in eternity future, and thus the interplay between determination and freedom remains for eternity. In other words, since God has a determined will and a free will before He creates, He necessarily has the same determined will and free will after He creates, and for all eternity. One way to look at this metaphysical enigma in God is to acknowledge that God's change of mind is foreknown by God as all His thoughts and acts foreknown, but this also means that the freedom to change His mind is foreknown and must be an actual attribute of the Divine Essence. Just as the Divine Essence cannot bind God to create, so the Divine Essence cannot limit God's freedom to change His mind when a change of mind is the proper act for Him to perform. As such, one can argue that when God changes his mind, God remains immutable because he allows himself to change his mind when confronted by temporal situations that, in order for God to do the right thing and remain just and immutable, a particular situation will demand mercy to be administered when judgment, was previously intended. Whereas Aquinas might say that God, as the prime mover, is himself moved by love, we can also say that God is moved by justice. It also necessarily means that the judgment God intended must be from a true and real intent. As such, the intention cannot be made into a metaphor or classified as fiction, otherwise God would be fabricating something that was not true and real, as well as infringe on God's metaphysical freedom to intend to do something yet not do it in the end because of higher metaphysical reasons. Hence, the foundation upon which we must deal with the antinomy between God's determinations and God's freedom will be guided by at least one overarching dictum, namely, that God must be true to himself, for as St. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 13, quote, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself, unquote. At the top of the list as to why God cannot deny himself is that God cannot lie either about himself or how he deals with his creation, as St. Paul says in Titus 1 verse 2, quote, God, who never lies, promised us eternal life, unquote. Since God had the choice to create or not create, what in God answered the question? Did his determined will answer the question or did his free will answer the question, or was it some mysterious combination of both? In other words, in whatever manner the option of whether to create or not create presented itself to God, if we maintain that God had the freedom not to create, then the choice not to create must be as real and true a possibility as the choice to create. The choice not to create cannot be a fiction or something that has no real possibility to exist. It must be a real choice with a real possibility to exist, otherwise there is no freedom in God and He must be a determined being. Accordingly, it should be the case that God's freedom must be equal to God's determinations. Extending the argument, it would necessarily mean that the accounts in Scripture that depict God changing His mind must come from His divine freedom and thus they must be true and real and cannot be a fiction or merely potential events that have no real possibility of occurring. Michael Dodd's attempts to tackle this question late in his book, as follows. Quote, we understand creation as a free and gratuitous act of divine love. Can we affirm both God's freedom in creation and God's immutability in being? This double affirmation may seem problematic for two reasons. First, the very notion of freedom may seem to imply changeability of will. What is freedom if not, minimally, the ability to change one's mind? Second, the notion of creation may appear to imply some change in God. If God's will is the cause of creatures, how could there first be no creatures and then existing creatures except through a change in that will? 
Does the freedom of the divine creative act require that gods will be changeable? If creation is a free act, God can either will it or not. Must not gods will therefore be changeable, since whatever is able, quoting Aquinas, to incline to either of two opposites is mutable, unquote, and since God can do other things than what he does. To evaluate such arguments, we might begin with two questions. First, can God will things other than those he wills? Second, if God were to will other things, would he then be different from what he is presently? The first question arises because God's creative will is not subject to absolute necessity. Absolute necessity may be applied to God only with respect to those things that belong to his nature. So it is absolutely necessary that God will his own goodness, but not that he will the existence of creatures. In creating, therefore, God, quoting Aquinas, does not act from necessity of nature but from freedom of will, unquote. Taken from Dodd's book, pages 170 to 173, and from Aquinas sentences 3, 20, 1, and the Summa Theologica, 1, 19, 3. Hence, Dodds and Aquinas acknowledge the conundrum of God's determinations versus God's freedom. Later Dodds, shows how Aquinas attempts to get out from under the conundrum. Aquinas will do so by creating a distinction in God's will, yet continue to claim that God has only one will. The Aristotelian metaphysics that Thomas uses often creates distinctions to answer anomalies and contradictions. In the end, however, it is not a genuine answer to the question, but only a semantic rearranging of the issues that poses as a solution. Let's see how this happens. Dodds says. Quote, the question may be answered using Aquinas's distinction between absolute necessity and conditional necessity. When we talk of conditional necessity with respect to the divine will, we must remember God's will is not like ours. We choose the end by one act of will and the means by another. Socrates wants to be comfortable and so decides to sit down. We can therefore speak of individual acts of the human will, each of which, by necessity of supposition, cannot not be when it is. In God, however, there is only one act of will, the act by which God wills his own goodness and which is his very essence. We therefore cannot speak of God's will to create as if it were a separate and discrete act, like Socrates's will to sit down. In predicating conditional necessity of God, we do not pretend to understand his will. Rather, we intend to indicate that, in the order of logic, if we suppose that God wills the existence of creatures, our conclusion that God cannot also not will their creation is necessary by supposition. In the ontological order, we cannot speak of God's will to create as if it were an actuality other than God's essence, unquote. Taken from page 173 of Dodd's book. As we can see, Dodd's answer to the conundrum is to, more or less, dismiss the conundrum. In doing so, he appeals to logic for the things he believes he can answer but pleads ignorance for what he knows he cannot answer. The dismissal of the conundrum is based on the premise that since God has one will, then for all intents and purposes, God's, so-called conditional will is not really conditional. But this is little more than a nominalistic attempt to solve the problem. In the end, God's conditional will is merely subsumed under God's absolute will by logical necessity, and the merger is chalked up to, quote, not pretending to understand his will, unquote. Dodds does the same a few pages later and admits he is trying to avoid a contradiction in the Thomistic metaphysics. He says, quote, Our response, however, will consist primarily in a confession of our human ignorance regarding the operation of the divine will. First, we have to admit that if God were not willing the things that he wills, he would be in some way different. If we do not admit this, we cannot avoid contradiction. For if God were in no way different, then in not willing the things that he wills, he would also be willing the things that he wills." Unquote. But appearing to understand God's will is precisely what Dodds did. His overriding premise, 
namely, that God cannot both be determined and free and thus must have only one will, is the foundation that rules Dodd's analysis. In fact, on the next page Dodd's confirms our insight when he says, quote, Because the necessity of supposition, that is, conditional will, as applied to the divine will is so closely tied to divine immutability, it is sometimes called the necessity of immutability or necessitos immutabilitatis, unquote. But almost as if he is thinking it out as he writes, Dodds again reverts back to pleading ignorance when he next says. Quote, on the level of absolute necessity, therefore, we are free to say God could create a different world and would then have a correspondingly different act of will. In saying this, however, we would also have to confess our own ignorance. For what is the act by which God wills any creatures and how could it be different? We have seen that in God there is only one act of will, the act by which God wills his goodness, an act that is one with God's very being. In that one act, in a way we don't understand, God wills both his goodness and the participation of his goodness by creatures, unquote. Hence, Thomistic metaphysics appears to have painted itself into a corner. It simply cannot escape the absolute truth that God could have chosen not to create since he is as free not to do as he is in determining things to happen. It realizes that it must give equal justice to both, but since it holds to a particular understanding of what, quote, one will, unquote, is, it finds itself unable to answer the theological dichotomy. Logically, since from all eternity God was by himself and there was no world existing, then it must be agreed that being by himself was certainly a good thing. It is also logical that since God created, then the creation must be good since God cannot create anything evil. But this freedom the Church assigns to God has enormous implications. It first means God is not a determined being nor can his decisions or actions be determined absolutely without his freedom. Obviously, if the creation of the world could not be a determined event, then no matter what our metaphysics requires of God's will, the creation did not have to occur and God was free not to create as part of the essence of his being. Still, one might insist on arguing that God knew he was going to create the world, for God knows all his future thoughts and actions. Granted, but neither he nor we can use this truth to then conclude that God had no freedom not to create the world, otherwise God is a determined being. Consequently, the freedom not to create must be as great as the freedom to create, otherwise there is no real freedom for God. One might also argue that once the world came into being then God determines from then on what is going to happen and in that sense it is determined, but all this does is move the problem back one step, or, in this case, forward one step, but it does not solve the original problem of how God can know everything in the future, even about himself, and yet still be free or still have freedom to create or not create. God could just as easily know his future as completely void of a creation and thus live in that alone state for all of eternity. So we see that the issue of God knowing what will happen doesn't really solve the problem, and the same is true when we come to passages such as Exodus 32. Since God's freedom to create or not create, a freedom that is assigned to him officially by the Church, is not just true when God creates but is an integral part of his divine essence at all times, from all eternity, then God has as much freedom in Exodus 32 as he did when he decided to create the world, for God's essence does not change. Since that is the case, then it doesn't matter whether God knows what he and Moses will do, since the freedom of God to declare his desire to destroy Israel in Exodus 32:10, as well as his freedom to withdraw that desire to destroy Israel in verse 14, must be as real as any other freedom God possesses, regardless whether he knows what his choice will be. But the Thomists have made an imbalance to this antinomy. As we saw with Dodds, they state or imply that God has no real freedom in situations like Exodus 32. They will thus interpret Exodus 32 in any way but a face value manner, some choosing to make it as if God is merely acting out a desire to destroy Israel, and the purpose of the acting is to get Moses to appease God, and after Moses appeases God, then God can put in play what he had predetermined to do all along, that is, 
have mercy on Israel and not destroy them. Others choose to interpret Exodus 32 by claiming that the description of God wanting to destroy Israel is merely an anthropomorphism, that is, the writer of the narrative is merely assigning human characteristics to God, but they never really happen the way they are recorded in Scripture. The ostensible reason is so that the uneducated men who eventually read this passage will develop a strong resolve to refrain from sin because they have witnessed a frightening picture of God's ultimate wrath, as if the writer was telling them a childhood fable, a fable in which the events and dialogues of the passage are fictitious but still motivate the child toward good moral behavior. In other words, the events and dialogues of Exodus 32 did not happen as recorded but were put into the mouths of both God and Moses for mere literary effect and appeal. To reiterate, although they admit the passage is written with plenty of emotion, exasperation, and verbalizing of both parties, this is only exhibited by Scripture, because the human actors and the future readers live in a human world of acute affections and expressive articulations, and thus God condescends to them and couches his actions toward them in the same kind of emotive communication. In short, God becomes a Shakespeare who acts out his desires by using short literary skits to make a moral impression, but the whole event is just a portrayal of life, not a history in itself. They choose this method of interpreting Old Testament narratives because their metaphysics dictates that God can't change his mind, can't get angry at sin, can't lose his patience over incessant sinners, and can't speak in ultimatums against those who repeatedly reject him. Ironically, the very God who Michael Dodds, through his metaphysics, admits in the end that he doesn't understand, is the very God that he refuses to accept from Scripture that tells him that God is everything Mr. Dodds says he can't be. What an ironic yet sad position to be in. Besides making God merely a play actor, another problem with anthropomorphic interpretation of Scripture is, what happens when the reader becomes educated and learns about anthropomorphic language, figures of speech, and symbolic language he is going to realize that scripture was not telling him the truth about God, or even that God himself was not telling him the truth about God. For example, he is going to realize that in the over 200 instances that scripture says God became angry at the sin of man, God never really became angry at all. Why? Because the metaphysics has already decided that God cannot get angry. Likewise, the earnest reader is going to realize that in the dozens of instances in which God says he is going to change his mind about punishing someone or some group because they have not repented of sin, none of this actually occurs because, as we are told, God cannot change his mind, some saying that God cannot even talk in human language. In the end, the reader is going to ask the obvious question, if God has no anger and can't change his mind, then why does Scripture speak to me in this way considering that it is not a true description of God and that I, immediately after childhood, will outgrow such feeble and artificial attempts to get my attention? Why doesn't God just speak to me in plain language instead of pretending that he is angry or that he can really change his mind when he can't? Is he afraid that his plain language isn't good enough to make serious communications? Is he afraid I won't listen unless he embellishes his words with all kinds of emotions and ultimatums? If so, isn't he also afraid that in me finding out that he's using anthropomorphisms that I will think less of him for stooping to such fabricated and fallacious language? As we can see, the anthropomorphic answer is not all it is cracked up to be. It creates more problems than it solves, and most of all, it questions the very integrity of God, the very thing we are trying to preserve. Hence the interpretation of Exodus 32 that preserves God's integrity and immutability is that God speaks in effective language because God is effective, and thus he is not putting on an act when he says in verse 9 that he desires to destroy Israel because they are a stiff-necked people who turn away from him at the drop of a hat. He is not play-acting when he says that he is extremely angry at them for treating him as if he were nothing and have done so since the time they have been in Egypt. And, of course, he is not play-acting when he changes his mind and says he will not destroy them when Moses appeases him of his anger. But, of course, to use this interpretation one must not be afraid to interpret scripture at face value, 
to trust that it is giving us the God's honest truth in every word, letter, and sentence about what occurred and what was said. To do so requires that we adjust our metaphysics and our science to the authority of Scripture, and not the other way around. But that first requires that we stop thinking that our metaphysics and our science are superior to Scripture. Few are willing to do so. And as long as they maintain this superiority, they will end up making a liar out of God, and out of Scripture. Another attempt to deal with the anger passages in Scripture is that instead of making it purely anthropomorphic, one makes it a metonymy. For example, Ludwig Ott says. Quote, Other affections such as longing, sadness, hope, anger, can be attributed to God only in an anthropomorphic sense. Anger in Holy Writ means the punitive justice of God, unquote. Taken from Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, page 45. Although there are many passages from which Ott might conclude this understanding of God's anger in Scripture, such as, Numbers 11 1, which says, quote, And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes, and when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed some outlying parts of the camp, unquote. Here the anger of God results in God burning them with fire, which Ot would call the punitive justice of God. As such, he would conclude that the anger of God is not really anger but only God punishing the people for their sin. The problem with this solution is that God's anger in Scripture does not always result in punitive justice. A good case in point is Exodus 4:14. After Moses complains to God that he doesn't have the ability to speak to the Israelites to lead them out of Egypt, verse 14 says. Quote, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well, and behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you he will be glad in his heart. Unquote. As we can see here and in the rest of the context, God gets angry at Moses but does not cast any judgment or punishment upon him. God only gets angry, but then offers Moses a constructive way to deal with the problem. At the least, this passage will not allow us to define God's anger as, quote, the punitive justice of God, unquote. Beyond that, it tells us that God has emotion, and in this instance it is anger. The anger of God, in turn, makes us all the more diligent not to let his anger turn into wrath, and as such his anger has a message all its own, which Moses certainly figured out. But if God didn't have anger against Moses in this instance, then there would be no purpose for the author to add it to the narrative. It would be totally superfluous. In fact, it would be a lie. Since the anger here cannot be made into punitive justice, then it must stand on its own, and the only way it can stand on its own without being a lie is that it is a true description of God's disposition toward Moses at that particular time. Again, in order to see this truth we must be willing to take Scripture at face value, that it is giving us the God's honest truth, with no fabrications, embellishments, or story filler. Are we willing to trust Scripture to such a point that it infringes on our man-made metaphysics which claims that God cannot have anger? Ironically, what we have seen in our analysis is that to inhibit God from having anger and changing his mind when justice calls for him to do so, essentially makes God mutable, because it changes him from a benevolent divine character who is willing to change from wrath to mercy into a strict automaton who only pretends to accommodate the free will of his human creatures. This is the basic problem with metaphysics. It seeks to wrap God up into a metaphysical ball, dictating to him what he can and cannot do, when in reality, all it has done is put man-made strictures around God that he, as a free being, detests. As for Thomas, it was none other than he himself which put a significant damper on his writings when, three months before he died, he had a vision from heaven, a vision which led him to conclude. Quote, the end of my labors has come. All that I have written appears to be as so much straw after the things that have been revealed to me. I can write no more. I have seen things that make my writings like straw." Unquote. 
taken from Thurston and Atwater's revision of Alban Butler's Lives of the Saints. Each can make what he wants of this self-epitaph of Thomas, but one thing we should draw from it was that Thomas, in the end, did not make himself out to be the supreme authority on every topic he addressed. And in regard to the topic we are now discussing concerning God's determinations and his free will, even Ludwig Ott, a staunch admirer of Thomas, says of him. Quote, Thomism very effectively stresses the all-causality and overlordship of God over everything created, but does less justice to the fact of human freedom. It is difficult in fact to reconcile primotio physica with human freedom, unquote. Taken from Ott's book, page 43. Although passages such as Exodus 4.14 are quite evident that God has emotive qualities, Thomas would not, as far as we know, interpret the passage as such, since it is from him that comes the idea that if God had emotions he would be mutable and passable. Unfortunately for the Western world, this stems from Thomas' poor concept of emotions, a concept he acquired from Aristotle and accepted without qualification. Aristotle understood emotion as merely the result of an involuntary biological function, like digestion or elimination. He speaks of emotions as, quote, a kindling of the blood around the heart, unquote. Taken from his work, Do Anima 3.15.63. Citing Aristotle as his source, Aquinas writes, quote, In the passions of the sensitive appetite there may be distinguished a certain material element, namely, the bodily change, and a certain formal element, which is on the part of the appetite. Thus in anger, as the philosopher says, the material element is the kindling of the blood around the heart, but the formal, the appetite for revenge. Again, as regards the formal element of certain passions a certain imperfection is implied, as in desire, which is of the good we have not, and in sorrow, which is about the evil we have. This applies also to anger, which supposes sorrow, unquote. Taken from the Summer Theologica, Question 20, Article 1, Reply to Objection 2. We must agree that if one begins the analysis of God with this rather primitive view of emotion as merely a physio or biological function, any attempt to ascribe emotion to God would be totally out of the question. Additionally, since Aquinas believes that, on the formal level, emotion is the result of evil, this just begs the question as to how can he then apply emotion to God even in a metaphorical sense. For if anger is evil and is caused by other evils, why would scripture use anger as a metaphor for God's actions, since by doing so it would imply that God can either be associated with something evil or is doing something evil? It would be the same as saying, metaphorically, God is or is like a murderer, when, in fact, a murderer is always understood as someone doing evil. Dodds himself illustrates the point when he says on page 150. Quote, if we are to predicate immutability properly of God in the via eminent e, we must find some sense in which the term immutable implies no imperfection. For names which inherently imply imperfection cannot be said of God properly, but only metaphorically. Dodd's appeal to, quote, only metaphorically, unquote, is made because Dodd's, in his affinity with Aquinas, has, a priori, already classified anger and change of mind as imperfections. Rather than saying God's anger and God's change of mind are perfect when God exhibits them, Dodds makes them ontologically imperfect and thus concludes they cannot be attributed to God properly, only metaphorically. But even if Dodds attributes anger to God metaphorically, he, by his own definition, has attributed or associated an evil or imperfection to God. This is the trap into which his metaphysics has cornered him. To be fair to Thomas, he also says that anger can be good. For example, he says, quote, anger may stand in a twofold relation to reason. First, antecedently, in this way it withdraws reason from its rectitude, and has therefore the character of evil. Secondly, consequently, Inasmuch as the movement of the sensitive appetite is directed against vice and in accordance with reason, this anger is good, and is called zealous anger, unquote. Taken from the Summa Theologica, question 158, article 1, 
reply to objection 2. He also says in the same section, quote, I answer that. Evil may be found in anger, when, to wit, one is angry, more or less than right reason demands. But if one is angry in accordance with right reason, one's anger is deserving of praise, unquote. And finally, he says, quote, secondly, consequently, inasmuch as the movement of the sensitive appetite is directed against vice and in accordance with reason, this anger is good, and is called zealous anger, unquote. Taken from reply to objection 2. So we can understand from Thomas that, although he would not want to ascribe evil anger to God metaphorically, he would say that we can ascribe good anger to God metaphorically. But in the real world, according to Thomas, God, in his essence, cannot have even good anger, even righteous indignation, even if the good anger ascribed to him is perfect and without sin. Why can't Thomas ascribe good anger to God? Because Thomas already made the fateful decision, courtesy of Aristotle, that anger is a bodily function, and without a body a being cannot have anger. This, as it stands, is an error. God no more needs a body to have anger than he needs a body to have love or justice. Virtuous qualities have an ontology that supersedes bodies, and we see them exhibited in both God and angels. Bodily exhibitions of anger, such as the surging of blood around the heart, are only the result of anger, not its cause. Unfortunately, this mistake from Aristotle has hampered biblical interpretation, via Aquinas, for almost a millennium, and will continue to do so unless it is corrected. The basic problem with this part of Aquinas' teaching, is that it fails to see that emotion is as much a part of a human being's ontological essence as his intelligence and will. As human beings are a composite of intelligence, will, and emotion, so naturally is the God who made us in his image, only his intelligence, will, and emotion are perfect, while ours are imperfect. Essentially, man, being made in the divine image, derives his emotive characteristics from God. Thus we see that all higher order creatures, including angels, who, in Job 38 7, shout for joy and sing together, and in Luke 15 10, have joy over just one sinner who repents. Higher order creatures have emotive responses, while lower order creatures do not, such as bacteria. In sum, all higher order creatures are a composite of intellect, will, and emotion. As such, emotion is not a sign of weakness or sin, but an ontological part of being, and thus an integral part of what constitutes a complete and functional personality, whether divine, angelic, or human. In fact, a higher order being without the ability to emote or feel another's happiness or pain would be a grotesque automaton. As even Dodds, who is very careful of what he applies to God, agrees, saying. Quote, because human sympathetic suffering has both good and evil aspects, it is difficult to decide whether and how much suffering should be attributed to God. If the lack of such suffering would imply a kind of divine indifference, even as the lack of sympathetic suffering in a human being implies indifference, then such suffering could not be denied in God without detriment to his perfection in love. But to the extent that such suffering in itself entails imperfection, it cannot be applied to God without detriment to his perfection in being, unquote. Taken from page 220. Considering that Dodds, speaking for Aquinas, has allowed sympathetic suffering into the divine nature to escape the horror of divine indifference, then it is only a matter of degree of how much suffering is going to be allowed and yet still hold God as impassable. Be that as it may, instead of seeing intellect, will, and emotion as three ontological aspects of both divine and human personality, Thomas only accepted intellect and will, relegating emotion to mere human physiology, and a burdensome physiology at that. Yet he would be hard-pressed to prove that sympathetic suffering is not emotive. As for intelligence and will, considering that in humans they can be limited or corrupted, we obviously cannot ascribe them to God unless we qualify what kind of intelligence and will we are talking about. Logically, it must be a perfect intelligence and a perfect will to ascribe them to God. 
as the Church has said, quote, God is infinite in intellect and will, and in every perfection, unquote. Taken from Vatican Council I, Chapter 1, Denzinger, Paragraph 1782. In principle, Dodds notes that Aquinas has no problem with applying only perfect qualities to God. After stating, quote, the way of negation is therefore necessary as a corrective to deny that the limited and imperfect qualities of creatures exist in God, unquote, Aquinas then shows the other side of that truth, saying, quote, divine causality also demands, however, that even qualities present imperfectly in creatures must somehow exist in a surpassing way in God since he is the exemplar cause of all things. For this reason, creaturely qualities, to the extent they can be considered without imperfection, must be predicated of God superabundantly by way of eminence." Unquote. Taken from Dodd's book, page 98. In another place Dodd's, says, something similar for Aquinas. Quote, to the extent, therefore, that immutability implies no imperfection, it may be predicated of God according to the way of eminence. But so may motion insofar as it also implies no imperfection, unquote. Taken from page 150. But this logical conclusion of Dodds from Aquinas just begs the question. If we ascribe what are normally understood as human aspects of personality to God, such as intelligence and will, then why not ascribe emotion to God by way of the same eminence, as long as it is qualified as perfect emotion, without any taint of sin or weakness? As the Church herself notes, quote, God is infinite, in every perfection, unquote, not just intelligence and will. If not, is there something inherently wrong with emotion that it must be discarded at the get-go? On what basis? We cannot make the excuse that human emotion is to be discarded because it is sometimes fraught with irrational motives, since human intelligence and will are also often fraught with irrational motives. Conversely, not only has the Church never officially stipulated that God cannot have emotion, Pius XII, in Mistis Acre Porus, says that in heaven we will. Quote, Rejoice with a happiness very much like that with which the most holy and undivided Trinity is happy, unquote. Here the Pope teaches that both God and man share the same emotive qualities of happiness as they do intelligence and will and will experience them together in heaven. Unfortunately, at the present time, this shared aspect of the divine and human has been obliterated under a mountain of metaphysical obstacles for almost a thousand years, a metaphysics that prohibits God from having any emotive qualities at the present time. How can he have them in the future when he can't have them in the present? And so God, in light of all the things we know about him today, did, does not change his mind. But what we know today, and what people knew at various stages when the Bible was being written, are two different things. Essentially, Mr. Eking's argument is that the verity of a biblical narrative changes depending on when it is told. According to Mr. Eakin, the people of yesterday believed that God gets angry and changes his mind, but the people of today know better and have concluded that God does not get angry or change his mind. Did the people of today get some kind of revelation to this new truth? No, Mr. Eakin doesn't mention any. It can't be the Bible, since the Bible is the document that tells us that God gets angry and changes his mind. And Mr. Ekin doesn't make any claims to private revelations from saints or visionaries, and that is because there are none. It cannot be the Church since no official document of the Church even addresses the issue. Instead, Mr. Ekin has another form of revelation he is depending on to give him this dichotomy between the past and the present. Let's see it in his next statement. Uh, theologians have a concept they talk about sometimes called progressive revelation. You know, God didn't at the very beginning just dump the entire Bible on the people of Israel all at once. Right. He, he in fact, the Bible was written over a period of at about 1,100 years. So more than a thousand years, these books got written in stages. In addition to the books that we have, he also sent prophets at various times that related 
oral traditions, some of which ended up in the Bible and some of which didn't. But he did all those things to reveal himself, to you know communicate information about himself to his people, but he did it in stages. He did it progressively. And so at the very beginning of his interactions with the people of Israel, they knew less about him than we do now. They knew things like he's a, he's a god, and he's our god, and he's the creator, but they didn't necessarily realize all of the implications of that. No one will deny that God gave information in stages. In fact, the Bible was written over 1500 years, not 1100 years. But whether that has a bearing on whether God changes in his words and actions is quite a debatable point, especially since the New Testament insists that God is the same as he was in the Old Testament. Mr. Ekin will explain in his next statement. Like, oh, space and time are created things, so God is outside of those, they didn't necessarily realize that. But where does the Bible talk at length about the nature of time and space, other than the creation narrative in Genesis 1, the very earliest part of the Bible? In fact, no other part of the Bible adds anything significantly more than what was already known from Genesis. Genesis 1 tells us that God spoke time and space into being, and thus from earliest times the people already knew that time and space were separate from God. For example, Hebrews 11 2 ties itself right to Genesis 1 1 and says, quote, By faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. Unquote. Except for a few passages in the book of Job, which was written around the same period as Genesis, and a few more passages in the Old Testament poetical books and a few from the prophet Isaiah, almost all the information we have about time and space comes from the Old Testament, and hardly anything from the New Testament. Perhaps what Mr. Ekin really means to say, is that he does not believe any of the biblical accounts of the creation of time and space in the Bible. He believes they are all myths and fables filled with anthropomorphisms. Instead, Mr. Eking believes in the Big Bang and evolution, theories that originated from the atheists of modern science and was later commandeered in the 20th century by various theists, like himself. Hence when Mr. Eking refers to, quote, progressive revelation, unquote, he can't be referring to the Old and New Testaments but to the modern understanding of time and space that he thinks has been revealed through microscopes, telescopes and oscilloscopes. Granted, mankind certainly discovered more information about the cosmos through his various mechanical scopes, but whether his interpretation of that data is correct is another story altogether. Almost all of the original scientists interpreted the scientific data as not originating from a divine act of creation but from the universe creating itself, whether it was the Big Bang theory, the steady state theory, or now, the infinite multiverse. The Church's traditional interpretation of Scripture holds that God didn't use a Big Bang or evolution but brought the whole creation into being, including time and space, by divine fiat in six days or less. In fact, the fathers and medievals would be appalled at the interpretations that some Catholics put on the Bible today. These fathers include Saint Augustine who did his best to interpret Genesis in six literal days and, barring that, interpreted it as one day, but certainly not billions of years. Time and Space But to be fair to Mr. Ekin we will take his argument as it stands, regardless that he is wrong in saying that knowledge of time and space came from later divine revelation and not earlier revelation. To begin, when someone says God is outside of space and time, what does he mean? He means that God is not inside space and time, and it is implied that if one is inside space and time then he is controlled by space and time, and thus he would be required to have physical existence in three dimensions, as well as be controlled by the passage of time so that the longer he was in time the more he would change or be affected in some way. If one is outside of space and time he is unaffected by both and therefore is not confined to space or controlled by time. If that is the correct understanding of being inside or outside of space and time, Mr. Eking is proposing that God cannot change his mind because change necessitates a space and a time in which the change occurs. 
So, since God, according to Mr. Ekin, is not in space and time, then he can't change his mind because, essentially, he has no time in which to change his mind. Is this correct assessment of God and the space and time he created? Well, the first thing we need to realize is that nothing is impossible for God, except one thing. It is impossible for God to lie. So, if it is possible for a being that is outside of space and time to still act, in sequence, in space and time, then Mr. Ekin's formulation about God is not correct. What authority would we go to in order to settle this question? Has the Church ever officially spoken on this issue? Not directly, but it repeatedly says that God is immutable. The Church never says, however, that God cannot act in space and time, nor does it ever say that God cannot change his mind. It only says he is immutable. Are there any examples in Scripture in which God acts, in sequence, in space and time? Yes, there are hundreds of them. For example, in Matthew 3:17 it says, quote, And lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, unquote. So not only does God break into time and space with a voice that is recognized by all attending, God tells us he is pleased, which is an emotive expression of pleasure. So let's look again at a more serious passage, one in which God, the same as he does in Matthew 3:17, speaks and expresses emotion, but here it is the emotion of anger. In Exodus 32 verses 9 to 14 we have the passage in which God sees the sins of the Israelites and tells Moses, he desires to destroy them for their worship of the golden calf. Moses pleads with God to relent of his wrath, and God listens to Moses and changes his mind about destroying Israel. Here we have a conversation between God and Moses wherein both must speak in sequence, in a logical progression of thought. Here we have the perfect example of the God who is, quote, outside of space and time, unquote, not only coming into space and time, but having a conversation with one of his intelligent creatures and accepting his two space and time arguments, namely, that the Egyptians will accuse God of leading Israel into the desert just to destroy them, and, two, that God cannot go back on his promise to make Abraham's descendants as the stars of the sky in number. Although Moses' arguments are not exactly correct since God's justice outweighs the slander of the Egyptians, and because God said he would save Moses and turn him into a great nation, thus, still fulfilling his promise to Abraham. Nevertheless, God accepted the arguments, and this was probably because, Moses, the meekest man on the face of the earth according to Numbers 12:3, had presented them to him. In this way, Moses is a type of Christ, an intercessor who appeases God's anger against the sins of man so that man can have another chance. We also see that God is not some robotic automaton but a personal being who comes into space and time and shows that he is angry at the sins of his creatures, creatures who are made in his image. We also see that he can be reasoned with, and that due to his compassion for the people and his good relationship with their leader, he can show pity by relenting of his anger, one emotive quality neutralizing the other. But as descriptive and dramatic as this passage is concerning God and his divine personality, Mr. Ekin's thesis is that it cannot be true, since God, because he is outside of space and time, cannot enter into space and time, much less display the characteristics of becoming angry, listening to arguments that persuade him, and then finally changing his mind from one course of action to another. As to what God feels outside of time and space when Exodus 32 is taking place, Mr. Ekin offers no description. We assume from Mr. Ekin's thesis, however, that God just is, and doesn't feel anything, and is totally unaffected by what is transpiring in Exodus 32, if anything historical is actually transpiring. As it stands, according to Mr. Ekin, Exodus 32 never took place as it is written. But how did it get into the Bible, you ask? Well, either Moses or someone else made up the story and attributed it to God and Moses. In essence, the story is a total fabrication, a piece of dramatic fiction, a falsehood made to look real. Why did they do this? Well, 
according to Ekin they stooped to fabricating such stories because, the people of that day, being rather ignorant and primitive in their thinking, needed a god who talked and had emotion, and so God granted them such literature, even though neither the literature nor the god it described were true. This emotive and dramatic literature could be given to the people because, being primitive and lacking knowledge, they were ignorant of the metaphysical rule that God, since he is outside of space and time, cannot allow himself to be controlled or affected by space and time, nor can he use space and time as a vehicle of communication. So, in being ignorant of this limitation on God, God and Moses could get away with using the emotive and dramatic literature, and no one was the wiser. Besides, according to Mr. Ekin, God has the course of events for the universe all predetermined so that even if there were some kind of reality to Exodus 32 occurring in real-time history, God couldn't change his mind in any case because one can't change from something that is already determined from the beginning to the end. When you think about its implications, Mr. Ekin's commentary is a rather sad one since about 50% of just the Pentateuch portrays God as conversing with his people in one form or another, conversations that have the same sequence of logical thought exchanged among two or more participants who come to a resolution concerning their next course of action. In fact, the whole future history of Israel often hinges on the outcome of these conversations between God and man. To discount the conversations as mere story filler without any historical validity would be to destroy the whole history of biblical revelation, as well as make God a liar. Unfortunately, this is all Mr. Ekin has to offer. Every conversation with God and every change in action by God recorded in the Bible is nothing but a fictional story. The one in error, of course, is Mr. Ekin, for presuming that because God is outside of space and time then God cannot break into space and time when he desires to do so. Or is Mr. Ekin going to tell us that such breaking into space and time is impossible for God? If so, what verse of scripture or church dogmatic teaching is he going to use to prove it? But Mr. Ekin tries to cover his dismissal of biblical revelation by claiming that the stories are anthropomorphisms, as if that settles the case against any further inquiry. Although we already went over the issue of anthropomorphisms in depth, let's see if there is any more that Mr. Ekin can add to the issue to save his case. And so one of the things that scripture does to help make God relatable uh, to his people is it uses a mode of language called anthropomorphism. Um, anthro comes from a Greek word that means uh, human. Uh, morphe is a Greek word that means form. And so anthropomorphic language depicts God as if he were in human form. And so even though what uh, for Samuel says is true, God can't really change his mind because he's not a man. He is nevertheless frequently depicted as if he's a man, and thus capable of doing things like changing his mind. Perhaps you can see what is happening here. Mr. Ekin preempts any interpretation of scripture that would regard its historical narratives about God at face value, and thus he prohibits any conclusion about those narratives that the events and dialogues described in them actually occurred as written. Mr. Ekin then states that the motive for his preemptive interpretation is, quote, to help make God relatable to his people, unquote. Ironically, in Mr. Ekin's view, God can tell falsehoods about his nature, that is, that he is angry or can change his mind, for the sole purpose of making himself relatable to his people. Normally we call such methodology one in which a wrong is made into a right, or that the ends justifies the means. In other words, Mr. Ekin's preemption leads him to regard fabricated dialogue and actions as something good for the people, and never once considers that his preemption fosters a total falsehood about God on them, and us. Again, like reading a fable to a child, Mr. Ekin judges the story is good because the story offers a good moral principle, but he is totally oblivious to the fact that it does so by telling a lie. In reality, we see that Mr. Ekin's understanding of God is a being who cannot have real pity and compassion for his creatures because, one, he is locked out of time and space, and two, he is a being devoid of emotion in the first place. 
God, according to Mr. Ekin, cannot relate to his creatures in the same effective dimension as they do with each other, a being who cannot even have an intelligent conversation with them, and a being who can't even reason with them, which means that all other biblical narratives in scripture are of the same mold. For example, Abraham's dickering with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and 19, in which Abraham whittles God down to finding ten righteous people instead of fifty, is nothing but an anthropomorphic fabrication. It is essentially a picture of a God who is so locked in his own determinism that he really has no freedom will to act at all, even if, indeed, he could dicker with his creatures. You mentioned a case in Exodus. There are other cases like when God sends the flood in Genesis 6, it says God repented that he made man, oh, right, which right. would uh, imply a change of mind. Again, Mr. Ekin's metaphysics won't allow him to read Genesis 6, the story of the flood, at face value. His metaphysics of time and space will simply not allow him to glean valuable insights into the true nature of this God who created man and now wants to destroy him. Ironically, Mr. Ekin believes he is intellectually superior to the people of Noah's day, and that is because Mr. Ekin believes he has received so much, quote, progressive revelation, unquote, about the metaphysical and physical nature of time and space than Noah and the people of that day had, and therefore he has the right to avoid the literal words of the text. Accordingly, we wonder, then, if Mr. Ekin had lived in the time of the Church Fathers, would he have suggested to them that they cannot interpret the words of Matthew 26 26 literally, that is, as referring to the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, because, well, their understanding of space and time was primitive and they should not think that God can intrude into our space and time and actually change bread into himself. Um, we see other anthropomorphisms for God, like in Genesis 3, God is depicted as walking in the garden, yeah. you know, as if he had legs. Right. So, we can see that any time Mr. Ekin reads a passage that gives God a localized form, he will invariably dismiss the passage as not being true. In each and every biblical narrative about God or involving God, Mr. Ekin says it is merely the writer making up something about God so that he can make God himself quote, relatable, unquote, to his audience. Why does the writer do this when he knows that what he's saying is a total fiction? Mr. Ekin doesn't elaborate, except to claim that these ancient people didn't know God couldn't obey Mr. Ekin's rule of metaphysics that God, being outside of space and time, cannot intrude into space and time as he wishes. Consequently, in passages like Exodus 33 7-23, when Moses speaks to God who comes to him in the form of a cloud, but then Moses asks God to show himself in a more personable and deeper form, and God obliges by putting Moses in the cleft of a rock and, because upon seeing God in visible form all men will die, God says that he will cover Moses' eyes with God's hand until he passes by, after which Moses can see God's back parts. Mr. Ekin will claim this is all anthropomorphic fiction. It never occurred, or at least anything close to it. God can't be seen in any form, period, end of story, according to Mr. Ekin. Mr. Ekin's self-imposed metaphysics about God supersedes anything scripture has to say about God, no matter how graphic and descriptive it is, and no matter how integral to the storyline it is. Yet here in Exodus 33 we have a narrative that is about as real as real can get. God breaks into space and time and comes first to Moses in the Shekinah glory cloud, and, as the passage elaborates on this meeting of the two, he speaks to Moses, quote, face to face like a man speaks to his friend, unquote. But even as intimate as that meeting was, Moses wants to see more, and the text says God gives him more. He allows Moses to see God's back parts, and we assume Moses saw them. But according to Mr. Ekin's metaphysics, little or none of these events could have happened. And so, um, so one of the things we find in scripture is this anthropomorphic language, and we have to recognize it and say, okay, well, what is it trying to say? It's depicting God as if he's a man, but since we know he's not a man and doesn't really work this way, 
what's being communicated here. Notice how Mr. Ekin tries to justify his dismissal of scripture's elaborate and detailed historical narratives by claiming there is another meaning to it other than the literal historical meaning. In reality, Mr. Eking is pressured to find an alternate meaning because he threw out the meaning that everyone reads and understands. Yet, for all that, he doesn't tell us what the other meaning is. What he will probably end up doing, if pressed, is give some general moral application to the passage and claim the moral lesson to be the intended meaning behind all the fabrication. For example, He'll probably say that the message of Exodus 33 is that if we are really good and persist in calling upon God, God will bless us in some way. What way this will be for a God who can't break through the space and time barrier is anyone's guess. But we can depend upon one thing. In Mr. Ekin's hermeneutic, it is not going to be anything remotely resembling the actual events that occurred in Exodus 33. Um, it's a it's it's a kind of you know symbolic language like and there are other you know forms of symbolic language for God as well there's what you might call leomorphic language so Leo is a lion right right and so leomorphic language would depict God as if he's a lion you know yeah. God and, and right. so then you say well okay well what qualities do lions have that they share with God, and how can we figure out what this text is meaning by depicting God as a lion? Or um, there's what you could call um, anumorphic language. Anus is a lamb, and so anumorphic language would depict God as a lamb, and obviously that happens with Jesus you know, multiple occasions in the New Testament. So you say, well, what qualities do lambs have that they have in common with Jesus that would shed light on this passage? Except we all know by common sense that God is not a lion, and thus the language is metaphorical. Scripture uses metaphors in many places, but one place it does not use them are in historical events that include dialogues between God and man, dialogues that come to a resolution over some conflict, a resolution that includes one party capitulating to the other, such as Exodus 32 and 33. Or in other passages, when we see that God is quoted as saying this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, listen to him, unquote, in Matthew 17 5, so that all the people can hear and understand what God said, you can depend upon it that God has intruded into space and time and made his presence known. To be technical, he intruded into space and let out a distinct human sound that made the air molecules form a wave which hit the ear of each person there and which made their eardrums vibrate, and their minds interpret the electrical impulses as human words coming from God. He also intruded into time, because it probably took God about 15 seconds to speak the sentence in question. Now, if Mr. Ekin wants to claim that God's spoken sentence in Matthew 17:5 is merely an anthropomorphism that Matthew made up, and thus is also an anthropomorphism that Peter made up when he quoted the same sentence in 2 Peter 1:17, in which he claims to have, quote, heard this voice that came from heaven, unquote, it shows the length some, like Mr. Ekin, will go to save their metaphysical paradigm rather than listen to scripture. Let's ask the honest question. Since God's speaking from heaven in an audible and human-sounding voice verified by three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and one epistle, 2 Peter 1:17, as an actual event witnessed by many people, and which set the stage for the ministry of Christ, is there anything different from it than what happened in Exodus 32:10, when God spoke from heaven to Moses and set the course for Israel's sojourn into the desert? both of God Almighty speaking words that everyone in the earthly audience understands. Both include an affectation, that is, Matthew 17 5 says God is well pleased, while Exodus 32 10 says God is angry. Both incidents set the stage for the next series of historical events that occur to those who heard and obeyed the message from God. But according to Mr. Ekin, these incidents cannot be actual events because God is always outside of space and time and divine beings cannot have affectations. While we are here, let's investigate more deeply what an anthropomorphism really is. Dictionaries define anthropomorphism as the act of attributing human form or qualities to gods, 
animals, or things. This type of definition is true in general but it fails to point out that anthropomorphisms attributed to God in the Bible are invariably metaphorical. For example, Deuteronomy 26 8 says, quote, And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror, with signs and wonders, unquote. The first part of the verse is an anthropomorphism in the true sense of the word because it is metaphorical, that is, God did not rescue Israel from Egypt by bringing down a giant arm from heaven. Rather, God's kindness in delivering Israel, was as if someone had taken Israel by the hand and led them out of Egypt. The arm and hand are being used to create a dramatic physical analogy to portray a direct and deliberate action from God to save Israel. On the other hand, the terror, Signs and wonders in the second part of the verse are not metaphors but literal events that occurred in the purview of the Israelites who actually saw these particular manifestations in their desert sojourn. In effect, the metaphors of a mighty hand and an outstretched arm are added for the purpose of telling Israel that when God sent the terror, signs and wonders, these events were not just haphazard or coincidental. They were clear indications of God's love for his people, as if he were like a father caring for his small children. We do much the same in human relations. If, for example, a father goes on a hiking trip with his child and the child becomes tired so that the father must carry him, the father may then describe his experience by using metaphors such as, it felt like my feet were about to fall off. This is a metaphor to impress upon the child the suffering the father experienced. The child, in turn, instinctively realizes that the father's feet weren't going to fall off. Rather, the metaphor was used to impress upon the child the amount of pain the father endured. More importantly, both the father and the child realize that the metaphor is being used after the fact, that is, the metaphors are being used after the literal events have taken place, that is, the literal event of walking up the mountain. The metaphor allows the previous literal events to be sensed more acutely, but the metaphor is not a reality in itself. It is used when one wants to make a strong impression of a past event, but it is not used to enumerate the actual events taking place in the historical narrative. To illustrate this fact, let's say John does the following series of events. 1. He gets into his car. 2. He drives to the store to buy groceries. 3. He drives home and gets into an accident. 4. An ambulance drives him to the hospital. These four actions are the actual historical events that happened to John. But let us say that, after the fact, John wants his wife to feel more intensely what he experienced in the accident, since she was not there to witness it. In that case John might say something like, quote, when I ran into the school bus on the way home it was like I was being crushed in a vice, unquote. Since his wife does not know the severity of his experience, the metaphors help her acquire a distinct impression of the pain and anguish John experienced in the accident. But again, a metaphor is used after the fact, since they are being used to describe the intensity of an event that has already occurred. Again, this is because metaphors are used to enhance the reality of an event, not create an event. If, for example, Exodus 32.10 had said, quote, And God became angry at the Israelites, as angry as a mother bear robbed of her cubs, unquote, that would be a legitimate use of a metaphor. Unfortunately, it has often been the case that when various theologians interpret God's anger as a metaphor, they are doing precisely what is not allowed for metaphors. They categorize God's anger as a metaphor precisely because they have already decided that real anger cannot be attributed to God. The exegete convinces himself that if he labels these types of events with terms like anthropomorphism, this labeling sufficiently explains the passage. In reality, it is little more than exegetical sleight of hand. When an author, especially a biblical author, is seeking to record the actual events taking place, he must give an accurate and unembellished blow-by-blow -blow description of those events for his reader. He must accurately describe each event and, most of all, 
since all the events are tied together in a cause and effect relationship, he can neither skip over an event in the series nor can he decide that one particular event in the series can be eliminated or ignored. In other words, if the historical narrative has a series of events that we will call A, B, C, D, and D, that are connected such that A, causes B, and B, causes C, and C, causes D, and D, causes E, then the author, and the interpreter, must make sure they neither leave out either A, B, C, D, or E, when the events are reported, nor trivialize any of the events as something other than historical, such as being a metaphor or anthropomorphism. Like links in a chain, each event is necessary to understand how the final event is achieved. If either the author or the interpreter is not faithful to the cause and effect relationship enumerated in the narrative, then they will either distort or destroy the narrative. As such, none of the events in the narrative can be categorized as fiction, that is, using an anthropomorphism in order to fictionalize a part of the sequence. They must always be truthful, and accurate to what actually occurred. Another way various theologians escape the reality of passages like Exodus 32 and 33 is by dismissing as fictitious any historical events recorded in the Bible that they deem are too fantastic to have occurred, or that they deem as mere myths and legends made up, by various authors, and thus are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Today, unfortunately, most of Catholic academia believes in this erroneous methodology, a view they acquired from the liberal branches of Catholicism who foisted a distorted interpretation on one of Vatican II's documents on Scripture, De Verbum 11, from which they concluded that only those portions of Scripture that speak about salvation were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the rest of Scripture, the other 90%, was not inspired but made up, by various men over the course of biblical history. As such, they give themselves the right to dismiss any historical event of the Bible that they judge as untrue, including the miraculous events of Genesis 1-11, such as the creation, the flood, the Tower of Babel, as well as the Israelites' exodus from Egypt, where Exodus 32 and 33 take place. But this is a view of Scripture that was never taught or officially espoused by either the Magisterium, or the tradition of the Catholic Church, and certainly not taught by Scripture itself. Suffice it to say, it is a heresy of the highest proportions. At the risk of belaboring the point about metaphors and anthropomorphisms, let's look at another passage, Isaiah 64, verses 8 and 9. It says, quote, Yet, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou art our potter, we are all the work of Thy hand. Be not exceedingly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, consider, we are all thy people." Unquote. In verse 8, the author's ascribing to God that God is a potter and that we are the clay is an authentic metaphor. When we see such a description we immediately understand, from the metaphors of potter and clay, that the message is that God is in complete control and we are his servants, as a potter is in complete control over his spinning wheel as to how he will form the clay in his hands. The metaphor serves to intensify, in physically graphic form, what our relationship to God is like so that we can have a tangible mental concept. Conversely, the words of verse 9, quote, Be not exceedingly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever, unquote, are not metaphors. They are propositional statements to God, seeking for God's disposition toward the penitent to change. Other examples of the right use of metaphors in the Bible are Genesis 49 9, Judah as a lion's whelp, from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him up. Deuteronomy 32 3 for I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. Psalm 18 2, The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer, my God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 23 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Isaiah 5 5, 
and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured, I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. John 8 12, I am the light of the world, he who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. John 15 6, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Revelation 19 7, For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. To be sure, we use the same type of metaphors for human actions. For example, we say, quote, we gave them a helping hand, unquote, and thus there is no difference between applying such metaphors to God or man. Obviously, neither we nor scripture use such language in a woodenly literal sense. However, there is a significant difference between applying giant arms to God as opposed to attributing anger or change of mind to God, for scripture is clear that God does not extend giant arms from heaven, but never says that he cannot become angry or change his mind. As such, God's anger is precisely in accord with his divine essence and is a characteristic of his immutability, not mutability. As theologian John Stott puts it, quote, God's anger is absolutely pure, and uncontaminated by those elements which render human anger sinful. Human anger is usually arbitrary and uninhibited, divine anger is always principled and controlled. Our anger tends to be a spasmodic outburst, aroused by peak in seeking revenge, God's is a continuous, settled antagonism, aroused only by evil, and expressed in its condemnation. God is entirely free from personal animosity or vindictiveness, indeed, he is sustained simultaneously with undiminished love for the offender. Taken from his book, The Cross of Christ, page 106. Although Stott is a Protestant, the Council of Trent agrees with his description, as it says. Quote, if anyone does not confess that the first man Adam, when he had transgressed the commandment of God in paradise, immediately lost his holiness and the justice in which he had been established, and that he incurred through the offence of that prevarication the wrath and indignation of God and hence the death with which God had previously threatened him, and with death captivity under his power, who thenceforth had the empire of death, that is of the devil, and that through that offence of prevarication the entire Adam was transformed in body and soul for the worse, let him be anathema." Unquote. Taken from Session 5 on the Decree on Original Sin, Denzinger, Paragraph 788, Section 1. Notice that the Council speaks specifically about God's, quote, wrath and indignation, unquote. Various dictionaries define indignation as, quote, anger or annoyance provoked by what is perceived as unfair treatment, or, feeling or showing anger because of something unjust or unworthy, unquote. The word wrath can have one of two definitions, depending on the context. The dictionary defines it as, 1, strong vengeful anger or indignation, and 2 as, retributory punishment for an offense or a crime. Although many times the Bible uses wrath in the second sense of retributory punishment, many times it uses wrath in the first sense of vengeful anger or indignation. In any case, the Council of Trent uses both, and thus can refer to both vengeful anger and retributory punishment, and thus there exists church sanction for God possessing the emotive force of anger. In a similar vein, the Catechism of the Council of Trent states in reference to the Eucharistic sacrifice. Quote, that the Church might have a perpetual sacrifice, by which our sins might be expiated, and our Heavenly Father, oftentimes grievously offended by our crimes, might be turned away from wrath to mercy, from the severity of just chastisement to clemency." Unquote. Here we see that not only does the Church understand that God can be changed from wrath to mercy by our appeasing of Him, as even Moses did when God wanted to destroy the Israelites, the Church understands God as being, quote, grievously offended by our crimes, unquote, showing that God is in the emotive disposition of being insulted or saddened by our sins. If this divine disposition were not a historical reality, the Catechism could not reveal it as such. 
The Catechism's portrayal of God reminds us of the passage in Genesis 6 verse 6 that Mr. Ekin earlier dismissed as fiction. It reveals, in graphic terms, God's saddened disposition when he was just about to destroy the whole world for its sins, saying. Quote, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground, man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them, unquote. First we see that, after the text says that God was sorry he made man and was grieved to his heart, the text then quotes God, verbatim, saying the same truth, quote, for I am sorry that I have made them, unquote. Now, either God said this or he didn't. Either the text is giving an accurate and truthful history of what God said, or it isn't. If it is understood as a true and real event, even as God spoke, quote, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, unquote, in Matthew 17 5 is a real event that inaugurates the ministry of Jesus Christ, then we must accept every word of Genesis 6 verse 6 as absolutely true. If we don't, then we might as well disregard the rest of Scripture, since it claims to have the same authority as Genesis 6 verse 6, for as St. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3:16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This means we are required to accept the verbatim citing of God's words, quote, I am sorry that I have made them, unquote, as meaning exactly what the words say. If not, then we make God a liar, that is, someone who says he is one way but is not that way. There is no escape from this reality. Those who think they can escape it by claiming their metaphysical principles cannot allow such a resignation from God, only fool themselves and they will never really know who God is or why he does the things that he does. If God has no ability to have remorse for the sins of man, then here, in Genesis 6 6, he has lied about himself, which is impossible, for God cannot lie. In fact, not only does God here reveal that he can have remorse and be grieved, just as St. Paul says in Ephesians 4.30 that the Holy Spirit can be grieved or when Isaiah says in 63.10 that the Holy Spirit can be vexed, Genesis 6 verse 6 uses the strongest Hebrew verb to express God's grief. Instead of using the normal call form of the Hebrew verb, Ezarb, Genesis 6 verse 6 uses the most intense form, the Hithpal form, which means that God was very grieved, not merely grieved. So um, I, uh, the, uh, the, an implication, however, uh, when we get to the full mature understanding that God does not change, because then you go back and you look at that passage with Moses and you say, well, Moses is praying to God mm -hmm. and the prayer had an effect. And, uh, and, and I, so in what sense can we say if we say we can't change Moses didn't really change God's mind but there was mm -hmm. there's something going on between the two of them that is a, a different level um, in, in what sense can we say that prayer is effective if it doesn't actually change God's mind it involves um I'm trying to think of how to say it without using a big fancy word. I'll use this, the least fancy word I can think of at the moment, which is conditional. Um, there are uh, things, there are choices we can make uh, just as human beings that are conditional. We have chosen what we're going to do depending on what happens outside of us. For example, let's suppose that your son has done something wrong and you know about it and he knows you know well your son has a choice is he going to fess up and tell the truth and apologize or is he going to try to sweep it under the rug well you as a father could decide okay if he fesses up and apologizes i'll go lenient on him uh, but if yes. he tries to if he tries to sweep it under the rug he's going to get grounded Right. And so you know what you're going to do conditional on what your son chooses to do. And essentially, that's the way it works with prayer. God is outside of time. He sees all of history all at once. And he chooses what he's going to do 
in response to our use of free will. This is something the Catechism mentions that in his plan of predestination, God takes into account the free will choices of his creatures, and that's us. A creature is just something that's created. Yeah. And so, um, so God uh, chooses how to respond based on what we do. Now, we don't have access to that information before we interact with God, before we pray or don't pray. But so it could look like from the perspective of Moses, let's say, God is is going to destroy the Israelites if Moses doesn't intercede for them. Moses doesn't know that God has chosen that if he intercedes, he'll go lenient yeah. on the Israelites. Right. So, so all Moses understands is those people are about to get destroyed. But Moses intercedes, and at that unlocks a, God's decision to be um, to be gentle with the Israelites for Moses' sake. And so God's mind hasn't really changed. He knew what he was going to do, right. wh whether Moses asked or didn't ask for him to spare the Israelites. But since Moses did ask, history went down this one path. If Mo Moses had not asked, history would have gone down a different path. Let's take this paragraph apart, piece by piece. Mr. Eking claims, quote, so all Moses understands is, those people are about to get destroyed, unquote. In other words, God has led Moses to believe a falsehood since according to Mr. Ekin, God actually has no intention of destroying the Israelites even though he told Moses that he did. Moses, the meek man that he is, believes God is going to destroy the Israelites because he trusts what God tells him, and thus he pleads with God not to destroy them. But in Mr. Ekin's view, all of Moses' thoughts and actions were superfluous because God didn't really mean what he told Moses. Thus Mr. Ekin's God is a determined being without any freedom, a God who is divided in himself, a God who says one thing and does another. A God who simply can't be trusted when he comes to us and says he wants to do a certain thing. Second, Mr. Ekin's attempt to apply the analogy of prayer to Exodus 32 is a misapplication. In Exodus 32, God initiates the event and dialogue by saying he is going to do something, and thus he commits himself to what he said. That is, barring some worthy mitigation to change God's mind, God intends on destroying Israel. That is an undeniable fact. In prayer, however, it is the penitent that initiates the event. God has not committed himself to anything, except, perhaps, to hear the prayer of the penitent, and even there, sometimes God does not even commit himself to hear prayers if the penitent comes to him unworthily. Whatever the case, it is a fact that God hasn't committed himself to grant the request of any penitent. God will grant the penitent's request only if God deems the prayer worthy of his benevolence. As such, there is nothing in prayer in which God commits himself to a course of action but then changes his mind and does something opposite. In prayer, everything is conditional. But there is something deeper here. We have to realize first that Mr. Ekin's goal is to eliminate a change of mind in God, claiming that use of such language in the text is merely anthropomorphic. Again, that is because his metaphysics won't allow God to actually change his mind. Mr. Ekin claims, quote, God already knew he was not going to destroy Israel, unquote. And from this he claims that God did not change his mind. His reasoning is that if God already knows he is going to do something, then whatever got him to that point of doing it cannot be a change of mind, since his mind was already set on only one future event. This is another case in which the apologetic of Mr. Ekin allows the ends to justify the means. Mr. Ekin gives himself the prerogative to reinterpret or rearrange all the causes that got to the final effect to cause that fit in with his presupposed metaphysics. Scripture could have used Mr. Ekin's interpretation. Instead of saying in Exodus 32:14 that God changed his mind, it could have said, quote, and the Lord declared that he would not destroy the Israelites because even before Moses asked him, God knew from his eternal decree that he would not destroy them, unquote. 
but scripture didn't use that explanation, and, in fact, it never does. Why? Because that's not what happened, either in the temporal or eternal realm. What happened was that God said he was going to destroy Israel, and because God cannot lie, this declaration from God means he had every intention of doing so and it was not mitigated by the fact that God somehow looked into the future and knew he would end up not destroying Israel. In other words, God did not destroy Israel because of an eternal decree that God already made that stated he was not going to destroy Israel. God did not destroy Israel because Moses changed God's mind about destroying Israel. That, and that only, is what the text says, and anything else is a lie. This is so because, as we have already discovered, God is not a determined being and neither are his plans. God is free and he can decide anything in his pleasure that satisfies his goodness and truth. That is why God was free to create the world or not create it, because freedom is his essence just as much as his foreknowledge of all events. Both are in the divine essence, not just the foreknowledge, and they both are working presently, just as they were in Exodus 32, because God's essence never changes. He is as free now just as he was when he decided, freely, to create the world. In fact, God didn't have to forgive the Israelites in Exodus 32, even when Moses appeased him. God could have reasoned that the Israelites had gone too far in their sin and even Moses' intercession couldn't help. This is not a far-fetched scenario, since it happened several times in Israel's history, such as Jeremiah 7:16, when God said as for you, do not pray for this people, or lift up cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. In other words, God was free to decide any course of action he deemed appropriate at the time and we cannot say, in any way, that God was required to take only one course of action because he had already settled it in an eternal decree. Scripture never says God works that way. If it did, then the church could never say that God was free to create or not create the world. If it was already settled in an eternal decree, as it were, then God would have been forced to create the world. But this is essentially what Mr. Ekin does with Scripture. He so believes that God is forced to not destroy Israel that it allows him to interpret the words, and God changed his mind about destroying the people, as being only an anthropomorphism and not an actual change of mind. As such, Mr. Ekin destroys the clear cause and effect chronology of the passage. Whereas the text says. 1. God desires to do a. 2. Moses persuades God from doing A. 3. God decides not to do A. But in Mr. Ekin's chronology, the passage runs as follows. 1. God never really desired to do A, but only said he did. 2. Moses never really changed God's mind from A, but thought that he did. 3. God did what he had already decided to do before Moses even approached him. Mr. Ekin tries to cover his tracks by playing both sides of the fence. In one part Mr. Ekin says, quote, Moses doesn't know that God has chosen that, if he intercedes, he'll go lenient on the Israelites, unquote. But isn't Mr. Ekin's thesis that God didn't change his mind because God already knew that Moses would intercede and thus God would not destroy the Israelites? So, Mr. Ekin talks out of both sides of his mouth. On the one hand, God must depend on Moses' free will decision to see where the rest of history will go. On the other hand, God already knows what is going to happen, and thus it doesn't make any difference what Moses does. We see this dichotomy in his next series of sentences when Mr. Ekin says. Quote. And so God's mind hasn't really changed. He knew what he was going to do, whether Moses asked or didn't ask for him to spare the Israelites." Unquote. Notice that Mr. Eking claims that God hasn't changed his mind because, quote, he knew what he was going to do, whether Moses asked or didn't ask for him to spare the Israelites, unquote. 
So what are we to conclude from this other than it doesn't matter whether Moses intercedes for Israel or not? You see, Mr. Ekin realizes he can only say God didn't change his mind if, indeed, God keeps to one, and only one, course of action throughout the entire scene, and even before he came to the scene, that is, not to destroy Israel. But in the very next sentence, Mr. Ekin tries to make it look as if there is some contingency in the matter, as if something different could have happened. He says, quote, But since Moses did ask, history went down this one path. If Moses had not asked, history would have gone down a different path, unquote. Mr. Ekin can't have it both ways, especially since he ends up contradicting himself. But as we will see, he allows the contradiction to remain just so that he can maintain that God cannot change his mind and preserve his metaphysics. Ekin has already said, quote, and so God's mind hasn't really changed. He knew what he was going to do, whether Moses asked or didn't ask for him to spare the Israelites, unquote. Then he has no right, in retrospect, to now say there could be a change in plan dependent on Moses' free will choice to ask God to spare the Israelites. But we understand why Mr. Ekin reaches this contradiction in thought. It is because his primary goal is to make God's change of mind a fiction. Since Mr. Ekin eliminates God's change of mind, then there is really only one path the events can go, and that is that God will not destroy Israel, despite what God said in Exodus 32:10 about destroying them. In fact, Mr. Ekin's one-path view of the passage requires a totally different explanation of God's initial desire to destroy the Israelites. Although the text presents God's initial desire to destroy the Israelites as a sincere, just, honest, and heartfelt desire of God, Mr. Ekin's one-path view will require that God's initial desire to destroy Israel is dishonest and manipulative. Since according to Mr. Ekin, God already knows he will not destroy Israel, but he still wants Moses to plead for it, then God becomes a Hollywood actor who, in Exodus 32:10, goes into a fit of rage and feigns like he is angry to Moses, speaking in dramatic and persuasive language about destroying the Israelites, but doesn't mean a word of it. Since from his eternal decree or foreknowledge God already knows he doesn't want to destroy Israel, he nevertheless says the melodramatic words of Exodus 32:10 only to get Moses to plead with God so that God in turn has a legitimate reason not to destroy Israel so that he can coincide it with his eternal decree that says he cannot destroy Israel. So, in Mr. Ekin's view, God is crying wolf to Moses in Exodus 32:10 and this ridiculous picture of God must be accepted because the metaphysical rule, that God cannot change his mind, can never be broken under any circumstances. After all, we are told that the metaphysics and its quote, progressive revelation, unquote, is superior to scripture and its divine revelation. Alternatively, if Mr. Ekin were to allow God to change his mind, then all the drama of Exodus 32:10 would certainly not be a crying wolf, rather, it would fit like a glove with the storyline. For it would have God proposing to Moses, in most dramatic fashion, that he really intends to destroy the Israelites. Moses, equally upset, seeks to stand bravely before this angry God with an appeasement to assuage his anger. God, because of the gracious being he is and able to overcome his anger, is appeased, and thus changes his mind from the destruction he threatened. In this way, God is not a Hollywood actor who, knowing ahead of time what he wants his underling to do because God has already decided on a course of action yet does not tell the underling, puts on a dramatic show to persuade the underling to capitulate to his one and only course of action. Rather, God is an honest and heartfelt being who is upset at his sinning creatures and is ready to wipe them off the map in retribution, just as he did in the days of Noah's flood. The only thing that stops him is the heartfelt appeasement of his best friend, Moses, and thus God changes his mind. But Mr. Ekin's logic is, because history didn't go down a different path, that is, it went down the path that God had predetermined from his foreknowledge, then we can conclude that God really didn't change his mind and the story only made it appear as such for dramatic effect. But if God didn't change his mind, then Moses didn't really have a free will, 
and history could not have gone down a different path, especially after Mr. Ekin already admitted, quote, God knew what he was going to do, whether Moses asked or didn't ask for him to spare the Israelites, unquote. As a result, as Mr. Ekin eliminates God changing his mind, he also eliminates free will, and thus his teaching about prayer at the end of his program is likewise as contradictory. At the least, what Mr. Ekin should have done is take the position that God's foreknowledge was aware that God would decide both to destroy Israel and also change his mind about destroying Israel. In that way Mr. Ekin could keep both God's foreknowledge as an immutable fact and keep God's change of mind as an immutable fact, and thus do proper justice to Scripture instead of telling us that one part of Scripture is telling us a falsehood, that is, that God can change his mind, and thus force Mr. Ekin to cover it up, by attempting to call it an anthropomorphism. Unfortunately, Mr. Ekin's metaphysics won't allow him to do so. And that is because it is a rigid and stilted collection of limited principles that because it doesn't have the capacity to join the temporal with the eternal, is often hoist by its own petard. As a result, Mr. Ekin's version destroys the entire narrative. It makes a totally different story than the one presented in Scripture. Whereas Ekin wants to teach about metaphysics, Scripture wants to teach about God and who he really is. But the passage includes no such metaphysical presuppositions for Mr. Ekin to foist upon it, and neither does the rest of Scripture. The only presupposition Scripture imposes on each and every passage that it is exegeted is that we understand that God cannot lie. Consequently, since God initially plans to destroy Israel and then, because of Moses' intercession, ends up not planning to destroy Israel, there had to be a change from his earlier disposition to his latter disposition. In fact, the whole passage is a beautiful biblical typology in which Moses is an intercessor between the wrath of God and the sins of man that points to its antitype, Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate intercessor between God's wrath and man's sin. But according to Mr. Eking's ultimate scenario, Moses is not really an intercessor because God already had his mind made up and the appeasement is superfluous. Again, this is seen in Mr. Eking's statement, quote, he knew what he was going to do, whether Moses asked or didn't ask for him to spare the Israelites, unquote. We should also add that since God cannot lie, then his description about his anger against Israel's sins, which very anger, we see from the chronology in the text, evoked that the decision to destroy Israel, must also be a fact of God's divine disposition. The simple and undeniable truth is that God cannot be quoted by the Holy Spirit as saying he is angry when he isn't angry, or has no capacity to even get angry. To quote God as such without it being true would be a blatant falsehood from the Holy Spirit, which is impossible. In the end, God is simply too big for Mr. Ekin. Mr. Ekin fails each time he tries to whittle God down to follow metaphysical principles, a metaphysics which invariably ends up distorting who God is rather than reveal him as he is. As we have seen, the metaphysics gets all tied up in its own limitations and contradictions and thus in many instances it produces a God who is the exact opposite of the God of Scripture. The true God does not have to obey the rules of Plato, Aristotle, or any other would-be philosopher. God is who he is, and the only limitation on God is the one God put on himself, and that is that he cannot lie. That is our one and only apologetic, and nothing can ever replace it. The end.